Hi, my name is Phil Leftwich. I'm a lecturer at the University of East Anglia in Norwich in the UK. And welcome to lesson four of the Bioinformatics Virtual Coordination, Coordination Network Learning in R. Today, we're going to review data frame structures and the different ways to do that. And then we're going to look at how we identify and deal with missing values in our data frames. Now, when you open lesson four on RStudio Cloud, the first thing you might notice is that there's no .r file, but there is a .rmd file. This is what's known as an R markdown document. Markdown is a simple formatting syntax which allows you to author HTML, PDF, PowerPoint slides, Microsoft Word documents, all with embedded R scripts. And all the packages you need to use R markdown should come pre-installed on Studio. What you can do is when you press the knit button on a markdown file, a document will appear, which has been generated that includes both uh, any notes or annotations that you've written, chunks of code, but also the outputs of codes. And so this is really handy for authoring documents with embedded analyses. It's also really useful because you can neaten up your scripts so that lines of code that run together are embedded in sections that we call chunks. The chunks start with three back ticks and a curly brackets enclosed R, and they end with another three back ticks. And when you hit the run current chunk button on Studio, then it will run all of the lines of code contained within a single chunk. Okay, so this just means that we have the ability to write notes and annotations uh, next to our code without having to signify that it's a note by putting a hash next to it as we would with a standard R script. So today's lesson is going to focus mostly on missing data how to check for it and what to do about it. And for that, you'll need the R markdown file and you'll also need this data set, luciferase cell assay.csv. And we're gonna use that to look for missing data and run through a few different ways that we can accommodate for missing data. Now, one really interesting thing about R is that it's one of the few programming languages that implicitly accommodates and deals with missing data. And that's really useful uh, because your data is often messy and missing data can be a key issue. In fact, almost any large data set uh, will involve spending a good amount of time cleaning up and tidying up data, removing missing data so that downstream analyses are possible. Now, when we look at this data set, we should be able to see that our data has lots of missing values. And these are marked by this special word in R, which is NA. Now, there are lots of different ways to deal with NAs, and our main lesson here will introduce a few different ways to approach this. So, yeah, I mean, okay, so I just, I, I tend to use um, markdown files um, just because I like, well, I mean, they, you can make a little notebook out of them, which I like. Um, but um, how was it? Sorry, I missed I missed one of the last the last sessions. So um, we're we just running them as just as scripts generally. Right. Okay. Um, so I mean, I just uh, I like the functionality of, of of being able to run the little the individual chunks, which is quite handy. Um, so I mean, for instance, I can just here it'll just run. No, I don't want to do that. And it doesn't like to skim for some reason, but um, on the, if it's on the cloud. Yeah. So Philip, um, uh, I think you have some questions about like, is it different? Is oh, it better sorry. an R markdown file? Um, I think you mentioned earlier that a lot of things it, there's in several different ways to um, do things. Yeah, yeah. And so this is like an additional example. Yes. Sorry. Um, Fine. So, I mean. Basically, Markdown is really great if you want to get into the um, 
the stage of being able to publish documents at the end of making your scripts. So um, with Markdown, you can make um, presentations or PDFs or reports that print directly from your script. Um, and so, for instance, if you wanted to embed chunks of code into a presentation that you're going to make to produce a figure um, or likewise a manuscript, um, it has that nice feature of you could come back to your sort of, um, you could save your, your, your output, you could come back to a manuscript um, years later and technically your, um, uh, your, your analyses, your codes, your presentation have all been embedded in the document that you wrote. So it's quite a nice functionality there. Um, I've started, I'm not very good at it at the moment, but I've started trying to write, for instance, my presentations in Markdown um, so that figures that I present are attached to codes and data sets and analyses. Um, can, can, I, can I just add a, add a couple of things about our Markdown sure. documents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, if you scroll back to the top, um, yeah. so in our Markdown document, like so in our script is essentially a text file that ends in .r. And you can mm -hmm. run each line of it. And our studio knows that anytime you run a line in an R script, it's just going to run it straight to the, the terminal. And our markdown document is, is, is another kind of text file, really. Um, it just has a couple, couple differences. One is it's got this little block up at the top, which is title and output. That's just the, you know, the title of your, your thing you're going to make. The output is, is what kind of thing it saves out anytime yes. you hit. If you look up at the, if you hit the save button, Every time you do that, it's going to make a little HTML file, and that's going to save somewhere else. And you're going to just open that in a web browser, which is kind of nice, because you can take that HTML file and say, send it to your coworker, your advisor, and they can just look at your script and everything that it ran. Mm -hmm. For the most part, when you text in here, so you can see that that, that Phil's uh, on line six. He's writing about what the data set is. So he's got you know the Lucifer cell essay data set is a type of R object. So that's just text. So like in, in an R script, anytime you write text, you want to put a little a little um, pound sign before it to, yeah. to show that it's not part of code for this. It essentially assumes that everything you write is just text. Now, if you want to put code in an R markdown document, you can you can go to the summary. There's a menu you can do. So you can insert a code <laughs> chunk, or you can type control on a, on a Windows computer or Linux computer, control alt I, or you can just do dash, dash, dash. And it's the, 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 the one that's above your tab key, that little, that little quotation mark, the back quote, and then R. And then at the end of the quote, you have to do three more little little dots. And if you if you forget the top part, you forget the bottom part. The whole the whole thing gets screwed up, and you got to remember. To put you it in. forget the bottom part, um, and at the end of your document, and you you keep hitting run chunk, and it won't run, and you have no idea why. It's because it doesn't know where the end is. Right. Yeah. So you have the beginning and the end, and then everything inside of that that for everything from tick 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 R to tick 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 is a code chunk. And like in our script, you can run that one line at, line at a time. So if you just click to inside, uh, if you highlight mm -hmm. any of it or click to the right of it, you can do control enter just like you've always been doing and that'll run. Yep. Or um, you can you can do, or you can run the whole chunk together and you can do that by doing control shift enter, or mm -hmm. you can push the little, the little play button over on the right side of the code chunk right there and that will run that one chunk. And to the, the left of that little play button, there's a, there's a thing that runs all the chunks above that chunk. So if you want to, you want to know what a chunk does, but you have to reset up everything, you can hit that. Sure. Um, but otherwise, it is just like everything else. So it's an R script with, with extras. And the extras are mostly about sort of printing it up. I like these a lot because, as Phil was, was saying earlier, anytime you run this stuff, it saves it in, at least for these, these R notebooks, it saves your output directly into the notebook. As opposed mm -hmm. to, so you, and usually when you do it, it comes up in the little window in the lower right-hand corner. Here, your results are going to come up in the notebook, and they'll be right there next to your code. So when you reopen this later, you can say, oh, here's the code that I wrote, and then underneath that, here is the, the, the output from that, and you don't have to rerun everything to get that to work. And then again, it makes that HTML file that you can then share uh, with anybody you want. And they don't have to have R working on their computer to be able to see what you're doing. No, I was just going to try and um, show a version of something that somebody sent me the other day. But, um, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, okay, oh, I've, I've got a little notebook that's just been sent to me. But go yeah. Ahead. Okay. So when you, when, um, when you go, uh, sorry, I, uh, the quarter second delay means you're going to keep interrupting each other. Uh, further, okay. But, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, the one thing is often you'll see little tutorials online about how to work with R and they'll have bits of text, little bits of code. Those are almost all produced by, by these sort of R markdown files. 
Right. So uh, what I was going to say is that it's really, really easy to see these in, in, in your browser, right? If you, you, you can get sent these and um, or share bits of code. And, and like you said, you don't even have to have R installed to be able to see everything. Um, OK, so uh, can everybody, everybody is able to get into this and, and see it and follow it though, right? We're all, we're all good. Um, so what I was just going to run through is, um, so I've loaded uh, two packages, um, Tidyverse, which just gives us loads of uh, different functionalities, um, and this other package, SkimR, which um, I like to use, um, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail on that uh, a little bit later when I use it. Um, I have just loaded um, a short data set, which is actually a um, luciferase assay that uh, I ran on um, a bunch of different um, promoter chunks, so um, gene regulatory fragments from a bunch of different mosquitoes, and we put them into different mosquito cell lines, and we looked at basically how strongly those promoters produced um, luciferase. So we've just got um, the type of um, promoter and what organism it came from, and then basically how strongly it worked. Um, just to tell you what this what this data was, but um, basically the first thing that I, I like to do whenever um, I've input my data is check that it's been read in properly and everything is what I think it is. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to do that. So um, this first um, function class is very simple. We run it and it will just tell me whether or not I have a data frame equivalent to a, to, a, to a table, or whether or not it's a matrix. So hopefully everybody's familiar with the idea now that this just means that we have multiple vectors of different types of data. So it, it's a data frame rather than a matrix. But we probably want a bit more information than just have I got a data frame. And so we can interrogate our data frame in a bunch of different ways. So I think we've already used this before. Um, structure. Um, and sorry, Jacob, I was just going to say, feel free to um, shout out if you're answering stuff in the chat that you want me to address something in particular. Just to... the, I presume that the, the oh, we're just, uh, other people are stuck at the skim R part, but that isn't working on your okay. code either, is it? It, it is working. That's if right. you hit yes, um, it doesn't like the cloud as much for some reason, but if you, you should be able to do it without reloading and you should be able to hit yes. If it's not working now, don't worry. I'm only using it once, um, just to show you a, a different way of looking at data structure. Um, so I can just run it. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to work as well in the cloud. Um, so, okay, so running structure, it's telling me again, I've got a data frame, how many observations I've got and how many different variables. And then it's listed these eight variables um, and this, is the bit you, uh, that we, we should probably pay attention to in terms of um, it's identified um, that different variables are either integers, numbers, or factors. And when it's listing the factors, it's telling me how many different levels I have. It doesn't go into all of them in this sort of brief view, but it will start by listing some of the some of the different levels. Um, and that's good uh, in terms of uh, it will tell me, for instance has it correctly interpreted that I have something that uh, is a numerical value or an integer. So for instance, I suppose ID here, although it's a, a series of numbers, it doesn't actually have value. That's just a series of identifiers. So it's debatable about whether or not I actually want to treat that as an integer or not. Um, but it's a pretty decent overview. There's also glimpse. So less detail. Um, but maybe a little bit neater. It still tells me whether or not I've got integers, factors, um, or, or, or numbers, um, but it doesn't quite have the same level of detail as structure. So skim, I wanted to show you just because I think it's the, one of the quickest and neatest ways to look for missing data. So if I run skim on my data frame, then it gives me this really nice detailed data summary. Okay, so it's telling me exactly in the same way as structure, how many rows and how many columns I've got in my data frame. 
Uh, but then it summarizes some stuff really neatly. So it tells me that I have five factor columns in my data frame and three numeric columns in my data frame. And here, this is the bit that I really like, um, it will tell me what my completion rate is for each of my different vectors. So it's telling me that um, I have a 100% completion rate for promoters. So my uh, promoters vector is full and there's no missing data. But um, in sections like this, so um, gene.origin1, it's telling me that actually I have 88 missing data points in my data frame. Um, and that's really, I think that's really neat and really powerful in that it tells me instantly I have some missing data and that's the part of the data frame to be looking for it in. It also gives us some really nice brief summary statistics here. So it gives me uh, a mean, a standard deviation, um, gives me the interquartile ranges of my data. So the um, essentially the median value here. And it gives these um, <laughs> little blocky histograms, which maybe aren't quite so useful. Um, but there's a lot here for just calling one function, which I think is so I think it's really nice. Okay, so um, unless anybody wants to ask anything about that, I guess I'll move on to the next bit. So what Skims told me is that my data is looking pretty good, but there is a little bit missing. So it's telling me that I am missing some of my values. And here um, I'm also missing a couple of names in um, one of my one of my factors. So some of these um, uh, gene origin values are missing as well. Okay, so if I run something like view in my, I mean, I could look at my, my, my CSV or my text file, but I also have the option to run view um, in Studio, and that will actually put up my entire data set in a separate window, which I'm free to look at so we can see, okay, here's some missing data in my values range. And here, there are some missing values right at the start. I mean, I put those in deliberately right at the top just to show you guys um, but some of my um, some of my names haven't been haven't been put in so this this factor is, is missing so okay so I can I can go through my data frame now having been told that there are some NAs and I can see where they actually are okay so missing data um, why do we care about missing data well Basically, missing data makes calculations impossible because um, R can't handle NA. It's not the same as having a zero. It treats it as missing. So it's an independent factor. So if I run this calculation on four times NA, it tells me the answer is still NA. Okay, it can't, it can't do anything with that. So it can't, cal it can't calculate. And that gets more polluting uh, the more complex something is. So if I create, um, new vector and I try and run calculations on it and you can see that that data is missing and it continues to be missing throughout so uh, if you leave NAs in your data frame they are going to pollute all of your downstream calculations. Now there's quite a lot of different ways that we could try and deal with missing data but all of those things have consequences and so maybe in a bit um, it'd be interesting to hear from some of the other instructors or, 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 or anybody on um, how they approach dealing with, with missing data. So one thing you could do is simply run this drop NA function. And that will just remove any row contaminated by missing values. So if I did that, I'm gonna call it cell assay NA removed so that I don't um, overwrite my um, existing data frame. Because if I run that, and then then that has successfully removed any missing data, but it's done it no matter where it is in the data frame. Okay, so when we initially looked, we had some where there were some values missing, we had a couple where there were some gene names missing, but actually 
this column is a duplication of this column. And so by doing a blanket um, drop NAs function, I've actually lost all of this data, which actually I, I could have recovered um, at the same time as trying to remove uh, rows where I had NAs in my values. So that's quite a uh, severe way to do that. So the alternative is, uh, if I want to be a bit more specific, then um, I want to remove just those NAs from specific vectors. So for instance, the, the value column. Now, I just put this in an example of, of, of the way that R treats NAs as a different thing to um, factors or numericals. Um, we can't use the filter function. If we try to use the filter function to pull out all of the NAs, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, and that's because they don't have a value. So it can't, it can't, it, R is unable to look for them using the filter function. And by contrast, if I run this, okay, I can pull out everything that's got the label of AAG2 in cell type. So filter is working perfectly well, but I can't use it to pull out missing data. So the way that I would often do it is I, the R has an inbuilt function, which is is.na. Um, and with the, with, so with the filter function, if we tell it that in our data frame cell underscore assay, um, that we want everything from the value vector that is an NA, then it's going to, um, Pull out everything that has the NA function. So oh, sorry. I can't type, but that's because uh, it's very late in the evening here, uh, so I'm ready for bed. <laughs> um, so, okay, so if I run, so we can see now, in fact, what it's done is it's taken everything where um, there was a, um, in the value column where there was missing data, it's actually taken all of that and kept it. Um, and it's done it, so it's done it specifically, um, it hasn't just sort of um, it pulled everything with it with an NA. It's just taken everything from um, the, 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 where NA, there was missing data in the value. But of course, um, that might not be particularly useful because um, we don't actually want the data frame full of our missing uh, values. And so if we used this exclamation mark, then actually we can um, tell it to do the exact opposite which is to bring out everything that, that isn't missing data in the, in the value vector. So if I run that, now actually we can see that the data frame starts um, with, uh, and, and, and will only uh, keep um, in the data frame where, where we actually have um, numbers. Okay. So that's, how we would pull out um, our data frame and, and get rid of anything that is uh, missing in, 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 our, in our numerical vector. So that's how I would usually approach dealing with NA in, in my data frame. But, um, and, and I mean, this is the bit where if anybody else uh, has, has, has any opinions on this or, or wants to, to get in, I think it's going to depend a lot on, on the type of work that you're trying to do. But of course, if I just throw away missing data, then um, I have to be very certain that I'm not accidentally biasing my data sample, okay? Um, because you have to know 
point, you have to have a decent working hypothesis as to why that data is missing. And so this gets into the notion of data that is missing at random or missing not at random. And so if my data is missing at random and I have a large sample size, then I can probably then I can safely remove missing values without affecting the underlying structure of my data. However, if there is a reason um, or, or a, a correlation between um, your missing values and anything else in your data frame, then you may be inadvertently biasing your data at that point. So you can't do a lot with 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 um, with, with missing data in a lot of respects, but um, once it's gone, it's gone, and you, and you have to understand that you've, you've altered the underlying structure of your data frame. So, um, an alternative, I mean, this isn't something that I would normally do, but I thought I would show you uh, something, something else that, 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 that can be done, is you could um, filter and um, choose to keep or remove your missing values. There is also the option to, at any point, you could change your NAs for something else. So in this instance, we can make a new data frame. Um, we're using a little bit more of the, um, the tidyverse here. So we've set up a pipe to mutate value so that if something is in A, we're going to replace that NA value with a zero. OK, so we might want to take a look at uh, Okay, so now we keep scrolling down. Previously, when we hit a bunch of NAs, they've now been replaced by zeros. And that's true for everything in that value column. Now that's great, except you have obviously now fundamentally altered the structure of your data in that what was missing data, you have in fact now assigned it a numerical value, even if that value is nothing. Um, that is going to affect uh, if you do any sort of statistical modeling on this data, zeros and missing data are two different things. So you can do it, but you have to have a very good a priori reason why you would change missing data for something of a zero value. And obviously there are multiple ways to do it. So that was with um, the mutate function. We could also just run it as, uh, we could also run a replace NA to do exactly the same thing. So we ran that. Uh, completely different function, but that's going to produce exactly the same effect. Scroll down and our NAs have been replaced with zeros. So two completely different routes to producing the same ultimate result. Uh, and this is something that uh, Jacob added in, um, which I think is really nice, is that um, with slightly more complex syntax, you could um, change that NA function to um, just change anything. Um, so you would mutate if it's a numeric, uh, vector, so not changing anything that has um, so it's, because essentially in, in, in a factor vector um, it would well I mean, R R is not going to like it or is not going to let you um, try and uh, change missing values into zeros for um, for factors because they have no numerical value. So in fact, this one is only going to change NAs into zeros for anything where um, that vector is numeric. So we can see, uh, in fact, it's it's gone. It will have gone through changing value from missing data into zeros, but it has left alone this vector where uh, it was factorial rather than numeric. So that's quite neat. Just for the record, you wrote mm -hmm. that. I didn't write that code. Oh, okay. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a quick question? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is something that it's really, this is useful for something that I'm 
I'm working on right now in art, but one thing that I've had, and this may be stepping back now, but just thinking about the is numeric that you have here, and then also thinking about what else could go in, in the if else statement and using the mutate if. Mm. Um, what, like NAs can take different forms in R. Um, if you use head to print that, it had like NA with two little, the um, greater than or less than signs. Mm -hmm. And then, like, so what data type is NA ideally? And should you, like, best practice in terms of making sure that if you have NAs in your data, what data type they are? Because a lot of, like, I think sometimes I'll use is NA and then realize that the NA that I've introduced to my data by accident is not the correct kind, so it doesn't recognize it. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Oh, that's a good question. I know, uh, I'm but... spot. And if, maybe, if an example, <laughs> maybe if an example comes up, to demonstrate that that would be great but i just i'm totally putting you on the spot sorry uh, i mean that's okay i mean uh but if you want to jump in and save me that would be great <laughs> i remember back in the day, the i used to i used to have nan values all the time which stood for not a number and that behaved yeah. differently yes. in days. but i haven't seen an nan since i got back into r like two years ago yeah and i wonder I if yeah, I mean, like, maybe you can pull out that gene.origin1 and maybe we can look at the data type and then we can try to change it and see if is NA still works on it, perhaps. Um, just, I think that there's some times that I've run a very similar uh, mm -hmm. command to that and then it just says does not recognize or something. And that's a common error when you're working in R regardless, but when it comes to NAs, I get a little turned around. Okay, so what do you want to try and do? Um, the, what is that column that has the NAs in it? Like, what are the NA values reported as? They're, fa they're not factors, right? Oh, they are factors. Well, it, it, it's reporting, I mean, that, that, that column is, 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 is a factor, but obviously, um, it's not reporting the NAs as a factor. It, they are still just missing. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's not, um, it's not including those. So in fact, so yeah. gene.origin so and gene.origin1 have the same, would have the same data in them. And yeah. I guess if we went back okay. to our structure, yeah. then, yeah, so, you know, it's telling okay. us that they have the same... Structure. Yeah, well the, well, the same number of factors. So the fact that one of them has missing data, has those NAs, it's not added those in as an extra, okay. as an extra level. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have one question. Uh, the code on lines 124, 125, I think that's the mutate if and then using an if else statement in line as well. Could you break mm -hmm. that down a little bit further, like maybe even rewrite it um, with a couple other things or changing out some of the is and the if else statement just to, um, to uh, talk about syntax and what each of those things are in the parentheses? Sure. Okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. oh, I wrote this a while ago. Sorry. <laughs> I am one of the um, consumer Google's everything person and does not uh, retain. Functions. You can pull up the you can pull up the help menus and maybe that um, might be helpful. Or anyone can, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you do the, you do the uh, question mark in the console with mutative. Yeah, I'm sorry, the question mark goes yeah. ahead of yeah, yeah, yeah. mutate. Yeah, sweet. So I missed uh, last week's lesson, but I don't know if we um did you get in did you get into mutate? Yeah, we talked a little bit about it. Okay. So so as a as a reminder, so mutate takes um it, it, it creates a new column, or you can use it to save over another column, and it takes another, and, it, and, it, and so you basically, you, when you use mutate, you say, I want to take this column, I'm going to do some operation to it, I'm going to save it here. And what, the thing that we're mutating is the data that goes into it. So you have one data frame, and the thing that comes out is a data frame with slightly different columns. Um, so when we search for mutate if, we got this page for mutate all, and that's because there's a class of special mutate things. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that, that you can use. So mutate all basically says, we're gonna apply this mutate operation, we're gonna do it over every single column. And mutate if says that we're going to, we're going to apply this operation to some of the columns, and we're, we're gonna do it to all the columns that in this case match, match the first argument, which is in this case is numeric. So it looks at each column, says is this a numeric column or is this a factor column? Or is this a character column? It only does the operation to the numeric columns. And then the last argument is what operation you apply to them. And so, and that operation is, if it's NA, replace it with zero. If it isn't NA, just return the same thing that it was before. And apparently that has to be nested in that call to FUNS. And I have no idea what that, why that's required, but I bet if you take that out, it will break. <laughs> we can try it. Thank you. There was a lot of parentheses and stuff. I was trying to figure it out. Thank you. Yeah. But let's, let's break it. Yeah, get rid of that funds call. Yep. Didn't like it. No. <laughs> and I've completely forgotten why. So that's fun. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to look that up, and um, I can put it up in the Slack channel when I've when I've regoogled it. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, and um, but basically this function, obviously, you could use it to return uh, a zero. Um, but you so here, um, it's exactly the same piece of code, except we are choosing to replace those um, those NAs with the median value for uh, that vector. So obviously what you're doing in this respect is you are still changing your data set, but you aren't suddenly massively zero weighting it. Um, so if we wanted to run things, uh, any sort of um, linear models on, 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 on data sets, then uh, you get into a sort of a whole uh, weird uh, data structure if uh, you've sort of massively zero weighted your data. So in this instance, in fact, you're doing um, uh, exactly the same thing. So changing your NAs, but now um, suddenly you'll hit a whole section where uh, they're all returning exactly the same number um which is the median value for that value data frame um, i mean i'm not sure that i would actually recommend doing a lot of these things to your data um before you start analyzing them uh, but it's good to know what you can do um and uh to know and then i mean this is the sort of thing that you would have to do before you do any sort of downstream um analyses is work out what you're going to do with missing data and how to handle it properly Okay, uh, and I've just I mean, I've just written a, a couple of little bits at the, at the bottom. Um, obviously, this so if you are changing your data structure in any way, so for instance, replacing your missing values with medians or means, then um, you're starting to do weird things to the standard deviations of your data. Um, and this that I, that I, I touched upon, which is um, if your data is not missing at random, so there is some sort of underlying correlation between why you've got missing data points at certain sections of your um, data frame, then um, that is really going to sort of screw things up for you. But um, I, I think at some point we'll probably, I, I, I've talked about this briefly with some of the instructors, at some point we'll probably go on to do some sort of simple linear models and things and, and um, have a look at, at analyzing, uh, running some, some statistics on our, um, on our data and uh, it's interesting so for instance the sort of default for a linear model generalized linear model in r is that it will just ignore missing data uh, so you do have the option if you're running something like a glm to leave your nas unaltered in your data frame and it will just ignore them uh, because it can't handle them for um, but there's a couple of different amendments that you can run on those as well in terms of the way it will drop NA values, and I think we so we might revisit that later if we do some linear model analyses. Okay, that I mean that's the that's the end of this script. So um, 